and get working. So again, as uh, let me hide some of these controls. Okay. Make sure I can see what I'm looking at. So just as a, also as a pointer, two things. Um, there is a previous Arctos webinar where I go into more detail on, um, actually a number of us went into detail on tissues, containers, and object tracking in Arctos. Because uh, of this, I, there, I just wanted to point you out um, to more resources and more information on specifically how we, we have done this in the past. Um, but, and for today's um, webinar, what I'd like to focus on um, primarily is uh, the management of data and, and the management of parts and samples using Arctos uh, in, as our collection management system. I know many of you will probably also have questions about the physical design and development of, um, of tissue biorepositories. I'm happy to answer questions about those if you want to email them to me or I, can, uh, I will be doing some more presentations um, in the future about sort of the facility management itself or the facility design. Um, but I'm, uh, today I'm going to be focusing on the data management. So the three things that I'd like to cover today and sort of be thinking about questions that you may have are first off sample management, how to manage tissue collections in a variety of storage environments, how to integrate data with organismal collections and specimen vouchers or to deal with uh, samples that may not have um, linked vouchers or specimen data. Uh, how, uh, a brief overview on object tracking and barcoding. Again, we do have this previous webinar. Container checks, container history, environment history environmental history of samples, basically how to deal with incoming material and how do we archive it and track it using Arctos. Secondly, I'd like to go through transaction management and uh, transactions include uh, accessions, bringing in material, tracking accessions and also loans, tracking permits and usage encumbrances, uh, managing uh, parent-child relationships when we subsample a part and send it off for a loan. We get back, um, sometimes we get back DNA extractions. How do you manage those parent-child relationships to track which DNA sequence was related to which extraction to which parent? And then finally, usage tracking. How do we link citations and gen bank sequences and other um, whole genome databases back to Arctos records? And the Arct I'd like to talk about the Arctos gen bank discovery tool. So the types of genomic resources that we can manage in Arctos are very broad. I've listed here, um, everything I have listed here, I know of as being archived in an Arctos database in one of our collections. Again, we are a, a consortium of multiple different collections. I'm at the University of New Mexico, Kendall's at the University of Alaska Fairbanks, but we have over 200 collections in Arctos um, and uh, a number of different tissue and uh, collections of biorepositories. But across all of our different organizations, we have most of these types of samples and most recently environmental samples and eDNA. Um, I don't know about cell cultures, to be honest, although I know that we have voucher specimens that are linked to cell cultures and other collections. And I'm also aware of uh, formal and fixed um, and uh, paraffin embedded tissue blocks, but I'm not sure that we have any in our own collections. But we have frozen tissues, DNA, RNA, embryos, parasites, viral uh, sequences and pa other pa pathogens, karyotypes, species, saliva, skin swabs, microbiome samples, etc. And also something um, that may, people may not normally consider to be uh, tissue or uh, genomic resources, which are increasingly becoming so, which is whole organisms that are either frozen or in ethanol or even partial organisms, sometimes even ethanol preserved at room temperature, as well as herbarium sheets and pinned insects, which are um, uh, the primary source of genetic material for herbaria and entomology collections. And, and, and uh, they've been um, less reliant on large frozen tissue collections as the vertebrate collections have. We can also manage different storage environments, uh, cold storage from, from uh, minus 20 freezers to ultra low freezers and vapor phase nitrogen, different types of dry storage, including dry DNA or slides, um, herbarium sheets, et cetera and fluid preserved. So all of these can be managed as uh, through our object tracking database as well as our catalog database and um, incorporated into object tracking. Now this is a big slide, but it just ba basically, these are the different types of genomic data that we're having to deal with just with our collection management system, things that are associated with genomic samples, sample identifiers, provenance of when, where, and um, it was collected, uh, what is the voucher? Can we link to the voucher? 
What is the storage location, location history, the environmental history of the samples? Has it been um, kept at a particular temperature or humidity? Has it been exposed to a freezer failure? Usage history, parent-child relationships, et cetera. And obviously, ultimately, we want the information about the genes, the genomes, the DNA, and um, the links to the external repositories. So I want to quickly also say that Arctos really has two separate databases. It has an object tracking database that can be used to um, initiate tracking of samples at the moment of the, in the field. So we can use a barcode system, which are, these are unique identifiers that can be um, reserved in Arctos, that can be printed as stickers, that can be applied to a tube or a cryovial in the field at the time of collection. That cryovial can then be scanned into a doer or a freezer box or a freezer. And um, I prefer to use uh, stickers that will, one sticker will go onto the tube and one will go onto the data sheet to create a linkage. And then these can track those parts through time as they're moved from one place to the other. And this occurs independently from the collection management cataloging system. So this whole object tracking system can be used in whether or not the sample or the organism is cataloged yet into the database. Once if you add that barcode to the um, part in the catalog record, that linkage is created. But these databases can, can operate independently and it's very useful for when you're working in the field, you want to make a, you want to, to identify a particular sample and track it through time and, and keep the linkage with its um, host data or its source data. That's what we can use both of these parallel databases for. And just some examples of those types of barcodes that we use. Um, we have three different, I've got three different kinds of barcode stickers on the right. The, le the one on the left is we, something we apply to a uh, freezer box. The one in the middle has three identical barcodes that are base 36 um, barcodes so they can be made pr and printed small. These are require the use of 2D scanners. And one, of, one, the one on the left can go on a data page. The wraparound in the middle can go on a cryovial. The, the identical third one on the right could also go on a, a cryovial or a field catalog page. So we have three possible stickers. And then on the right is another example where there's just two duplicates. So we can apply those to the cryovial. We also have printed stickers that we can apply with different kinds of identifiers on the tubes, and we use those to scan them into position in, in a box and track them. Okay, so I'm going to stay here. Go now to um, our Arctos page. Uh, this is our search page. So if you wanted to come into Arctos and say, I want to find all your samples with tissues. Just um, as a public user, we have a public portal, and then each individual collection has their own um, managed data that has tools only available to the individual collection managers for that collection. So I'm looking right now at the at the public portal page. So you can search on a specific um, identifier from a particular collection. These are all of our different collections. You could choose to search these different institutions. You could search on a particular catalog number. You can show more options so that you can find a particular identifier. You could even find, you can do a list of options. You can search on GenBank numbers, for example, collector numbers or field numbers. And we have quite a long list of different kinds of identifiers that can be searched upon. So if you click require tissues, you click a particular uh, collection. So like, for example, the Denver Museum of Nature and Science, and um, we ask for what may they have, let's just, just click a GenBank number. You could select those options. And then you can also select some things like parts, perhaps you want to find heart tissue. Uh, perhaps you want to make sure that the heart um, is, um, frozen. You could search using those terms. So we have a variety of different ways to search, and all of these are can be expanded. For example, maybe you want something that's a holotype or a paratype or a symbiotype. So that's our that's our public search page that allows people to find tissues. But what we need to do as collection managers is to be able to make it, make it possible for the public to find these to request them on loan. So we have to track them within our own collections. 
So if, um, here's a search that I did earlier on all the DNA extractions in Arctos. So all the parts that are DNA extraction and frozen in Arctos. Right now I found uh, 970, oops, excuse me, 971 catalog records. You can see this is the search results page. It shows me whether they have GenBank numbers associated them, with them. I can look at the citations. Um, I can see what, whether they're related to parasites or not. I can see who prepared or um, who prepared them or who collected them, the, the origin, what country, et cetera, the different parts. So I'm logged in so I can see quite a bit here. But even um, if you do this as a public user, you can also choose to add or review, remove different data fields, things that you would like to see in your download and in your search results return. So there's a lot of information available uh, when you search on these fields. So if I go to a particular example of one of the, of the records, let me go here. Actually, no, I'm gonna go right here. This is what um, a sample looks like that has genomic material associated with it. This is a, actually um, a rodent from South America that was collected in the 1980s in collaborative research projects between um, um, Bolivian institutions, the uh, American Museum of Natural History and the Museum of Southwestern Biology. And so we have um, different identifications of this specimen. It's a, cit a citation as a symbiotype. Uh, we have different expeditions that were involved, the people involved, different identifiers associated with this the host of a parasite that's cataloged in a different collection. So we have that ability to track parasite host relationships. And this is also an interesting project because many of the, the um, individuals, uh, the samples from these, this research work, these expeditions were divided among the three institutions involved. So the um, Colección Boliviana de Fauna in Bolivia um, received a number of the a third of the specimens, the American Museum of Natural History a third, and the Museum of Southwestern Biology a third. And yet we have to be able to track their relationships. So um, in this case, we at the Museum of Southwestern Biology only have the tissues as well as the karyotypes. Whereas the American Museum, or uh, in this case it was, yes, in this case it was American Museum has the uh, host voucher but others from this expedition would be, have remained in Bolivia. So we have the, um, and this record then shows tissues collected from a mammal whose voucher is in New York uh, and was collected from Bolivia. And so we have the ability to make these kinds of linkages and to track the different relationships between the parts that were derived and, and the specimen. So I wanna talk a little bit about what parts are because that's really important in managing frozen tissue collections and working with Arctos. This record is showing you a road, the record and the data of a, a rodent, uh, a tuco tuco, um, of some, like a gopher that was uh, collected in Bolivia. Again, uh, we, we want to make sure we keep the linkage between the primary data. What is the species? Where was it collected? Where's the voucher? Who collected it? When was it collected? We want all that information to remain with all the parts, the derivative parts of that organism as they get distributed across multiple different collections. So in this case, we have the tissues. If you were to go to the American Museum's database, they have the, the voucher specimen. And in fact, we can even go to the GBIF occurrence here from our record, which should show, we're hoping eventually to use this as a way of integrating the American Museum sample and data sample and our data sample because the American Museum is not within Arctos. So we have the Arctos information and the American Museum information in here through GBIF. So I just wanted to give you an idea of what these data look like when they get into our system. Now, um, I'm going to go to another record really quickly where you can see, uh, we're going to look at the parts location. Actually, we can do that here as well. So where, do, where are the parts for this mammal? I'm going to go to part location here and I can go into my object tracking database from that record and say, I want to find the liver sample because I want to loan it or I want to find the karyotype because I want to send it out on loan. So directly from that record I was in, I can click on this and see 
that, for example, the, um, there is a frozen karyotype in a freezer box in a cryo tank in my cryo room. And that, uh, that vial is in position 81. And it is um, associated with this catalog item. I also have um, heart and kidney in position 32 in another cryo freezer and liver in position 31. So I can immediately go and I can see, well, what else is in this freezer box? I want to see everything in this particular freezer box where the, the heart kidney is. I can go to positions and see what's in my freezer box. And these are all the different sample numbers scanned into a, um, this in this case, it's a nine by nine freezer container. So this is what I was talking about, the integration of the um, object tracking system with the, um, data, the catalog record database. Now, the other thing I want to, to talk about, let's see, um, is that you can also see environmental history. Let me go to one of those records. Actually go back here to my, go back to my object, my part location. I want to see, for example, um, this cryo vial. Notice that the cryo vial has a barcode here. Um, it is, we, we put barcodes on containers and the, that container, that vial encloses the part, the karyotype. So, Anything that can be put in a container can be barcoded and then tracked with an object tracking. And we can also look at its, its history. This is the history of that particular vial. In 2017, that vial was created. In 2018, it was moved into its current position. And if I go to the container itself, this is, I could edit this, cryobot, this uh, vial that's holding this tissue. I can also say that I checked it on a certain day. I can say that, well, what was the temperature of the freezer on this day? I can also, if this were not being used for cryovials, I could look at the concentration of the ethanol, the humidity, et cetera. So we have ways of, of tracking container environment and we can add more features here. Not, there are not as many collections using this yet as, as could be. And so we can add a lot more free, uh, parameters to our environment checks. And then that will become part of the history of that sample. Okay, the next thing, any questions up to that point? Anything else I should address before I move on to transactions? Anybody else? Okay. Please interrupt me at any time if anybody has a question. Okay, so here's another example of, um, a record that um, is more recent and it has some more data associated with it. First off, I'd like to show you uh, how we deal with loans, so transactions. This record here, let's see, actually it's this one here, had a parasite associated with it. Let me go back to the mammal. This mammal, scrolling up without trying to make you dizzy, this is a Martes Americana. It is a, a small carnivore that was collected in Alaska. And it has a citation because it was a host voucher of a parasite. And it, uh, this parasite here is linked. This is a stomach parasite that's very common in these Martin. So I'm going to show you that the the parts of the mammal are skull, heart, lung, spleen, and it has this nematode here. Okay. And if we go to the nematode, which is this record here, the linked parasite, that shows us this is a parasite of the same mammal we were just looking at. It has the citation of the paper where it appeared. And if we go down to the bottom here, we'll see that this is, um, this was loaned, this, this parasite, this worm was loaned in 2014. And I imagine it generated all these uh, SEM 
um, images, as well as generating GenBank sequences. So let's look at the loan and how that works. So if I look at the loan uh, documentation for this parasite, it was loaned to a researcher for morphological assessments and they would return the SEM slides. And I can see, um, we can, from the loan page, we can add additional items. We can add items by container barcode. We can, excuse me. We can review the loan items that are in this loan. All these are all the, the different worms that were loaned. We can have instructions for the um, researcher regarding this sample. In this case, it was not subsampled, but another loan we can dedicate, designate that it was a subsample. We can also uh, include encumbrances. So if, if there were restrictions on the usage of this sample, we could say, we're not allowed to loan this without approval of the collector or approval of the country of origin etc., then we would have encumbrances here showing up in the loan form. And that would be available for the collection manager as well as for the researcher. And the other interesting thing, the thing that's very, very helpful to me is the ability to link loans to projects. So in this case, we have a, um, projects associated with this research with the loan of the specimen is this uh, Beringian coevolution project was a project that it was involved with the collection of these samples. The objectives were to conduct an inventory of Beringian mammals and parasites and develop a database etc. It was funded by the National Science Foundation, produced 26 publications with uh, numbers of cited specimens and it used the following specimens and records. So we have a really detailed in information about all the mammals collected during this expedition and the par their parasites and the papers associated with it. And we have some media associated with images of specimens as well. So we do that by creating a link between the the loan and the project. Here's another project related to the re specific research of that um, investigator. So he used 17 specimens. So the transactions are intimately linked with projects and usage documentation. The other example I wanted to show from this record is um, Let's see if I can find it here. Is it this one? No, I think it's this next one over. Excuse me. Is how we can do subsampling for loans as well. So in this one, the mammal host of that had a DNA extraction. Oh, this is actually a separate record. This is a, a squirrel that was taken from liver that was on loan. And then a DNA extraction resulted and um, that itself was then subsequently loaned. So we have the, the part location of this, we have the fact that it is on loan, recorded, and then we know who it was loaned to. So if I go up here to my edit screen, this shows the parts associated with that record. You can see the different tissues, you can see where they are, are they in collection, are they on loan, are they subsampled? Are they transferred of custody, used up? We can record the condition. We can record the number of samples in the container. And we can show when a part has been subsampled from another part. So this liver here, part 2585662, was subsampled to create a subsample, which was on loan which then resulted in a DNA extraction, which was also on loan. And you can see the intent here, but it tells you the parent-child relationships between the different parts. 
We also have the ability to add part attributes. In this case, this DNA extraction was uh, frozen. So I can either subsample a part from this page. I can create a new subsample. Let's see if I can hide this. If I say yes, it will allow me to create a new subsample here. I could create this. Or I can also go up and add an attribute. And attributes allow me to say some information about this particular part. Perhaps it has, uh, I can give it a tissue quality. I can say the tissue quality is fair, poor, very good or excellent. I can say that the preservation is in EDTA or is in ethanol or is in formalin. So it gives us, we have a, a number of code tables that will allow us to, to say that. Um, so we have a variety of ways of documenting parts, their condition and their history and to show how they've been used on loan and what specific loan was linked to what specific part. And that's, I think, really super important is how do we link the transactions to the parts so that we know if we send a loan off, a, a subsample, and, it, and that researcher generates a DNA sequence, we know exactly which part in which place in the freezer was, was loaned that resulted in that DNA extraction. And if someone else needs to redo that study and they want a sample from the exact same tube that was used by the previous researcher, we can go back and find that and we can reloan that. Or if there's a problem, we can replicate it with, with, the, with the same material. Okay, so let me go back out here. There's anything else? Oh, then, then so the final thing I wanted to talk about is, and I mentioned it a few, little bit here, is usage tracking. So ultimately the goal of any, any museum collection, any museum repository, is to make samples available for research and to track that research back to the specimens so that we can extend the value of those specimens through subsequent research and build on the knowledge gained from a particular study. So the good thing about databases like Arctos that allow you to do that is that we can track the publications that result from the usage of a particular specimen, from the collection, the point of collection on how has that animal been used and what publications resulted and can we make that information available for future researchers? So we want to be able to track back. So we must be able to include citations that reference a specimen. So in this case, we're going to go to um, this particular squirrel was a voucher in a paper. So Arctos has the ability to link via, out via any kind of linkage. So in this case, we're going to go to the DOI associated with this publication. So this squirrel, MSB Mammal 28936, was cited in this paper, Impacts of Late Quaternary, Quaternary Environmental Change on the Long-Tailed Ground Squirrel in, in Mongolia. So we've got, uh, if we go to the supplemental data for this, this paper, we will find this individual squirrel cited. In addition, um, this squirrel was the uh, host voucher or symbiotype of a described parasite. So this other paper here describes a new louse that was taken from this host and a description of a new species. So citations can be added back to the records and then linked from the records back. Ideally, researchers would cite this um, correct catalog number in their papers, which allows us to make that connection. This is the importance of unique identifiers. And then the other um, 
type of usage and citation is through the genomic materials and sequences and uh, genomes that are that are um, <clears throat> produced by research. So this example shows GenBank. So we have a GenBank sequence here that um, two GenBank sequences that are linked to this Eurocitellus. Now I'm kind of curious, I haven't looked yet, whether these are GenBank sequences to the, to the squirrel or to the parasite. So let's go look. <clears throat> so this is actually to the squirrel. This is a cytochrome C oxidase gene, mitochondrial gene. And um, that link out that I showed you from the Arctos record goes directly to GenBank. And this researcher did a great job he cited the specimen voucher correctly in his GenBank submission. So we have the institution code, MSB, the collection code, MAM for mammals, and the catalog number in the specimen voucher field, which immediately allows GenBank to make a connection back to our museum collections database and the specific host or the mammal that was involved that generated this sequence. Now, the other thing that we can do is when Arctos creates a um, reciprocal relationship with GenBank, when we add the GenBank number here, which we can do easily by just going and adding a GenBank number to our records, one, two, three, four, five. If I were to add that in here, it also, at GenBank, creates a link out to, ex oops, to external resources here which means that even if the author had not correctly submitted the voucher information to the specimen voucher field at GenBank, we can create these link outs automatically with GenBank, which will take us back to the specimen record that generated that, those data. I think this is incredibly important with genomic resources because there's so many sequences at GenBank are not necessarily linked to vouchers. They cannot be replicated. You can't go back to the same tissue and figure out and take another sample or figure out where it came from. You can't find the host or the voucher, the specimen that generated those, those genetic data. So having a database system where you can do that and link back, link uh, um, both from the, the point of view of the researcher collecting the specimen and keeping track of that relationship and then keeping the museum linkage with the genomic resources is crucial. For replication and extension. And in this example, we have, we have the genomic resources, we also have the parasites. And we could also add if we had uh, information on viruses or other or pathogens, and there was an external repository of viral data, we could link that here as well. Because all of these are linked through, through URLs. So like what we have here, we have each of our records linked through a URL, and that's what creates the relationships allows us to link back and forth between the hosts and parasites or out to external resources. Let's take a look at a couple more examples of usage. I showed you earlier the GBIF occurrence. Um, so all of our records are linked to GBIF uh, there <coughs> where they have additional, um, make it much more discoverable. I dig bio and also Globi. So we have the ability, uh, one of our more recent collaborations is with Global Biotic Interactions. They harvest our data and they publish to the Globi database. So this is a relationship, shows parasite host relationships. So it says that this squirrel, which is listed here as Spermophilus undulatus, the more recent name is Eurocitellus undulatus, uh, has the parasite Linognithoides eurocitelli. And that is supported by not just the record we were looking at, but all these other records shows you the parasite host relationships. And this could be done again uh, with viruses, with pathogens, what hosts carry what path parasites, what hosts carry what pathogens, what pathogens infect which hosts. So this is a really um, neat example of what can be done as we build out these databases and these types of relationships. Um, and I mentioned earlier GGBN, which is the uh, global, let's see if I can get it this way, global genome biodiversity ne network. GGBN also um, 
we, we publish data from Arctos directly to GGBN. We're one of the, uh, our number of our biorepositories and institutions choose to um, provide data to GGBN, which also makes them are more discoverable. So I know that GGBN is working on their, um, updating their website, but currently they have, um, GGBN members are all the little butterflies shown here. And these are countries or institutions that are providing data on tissue and genomic resources to a common portal to make it searchable. So if we look at ours, for example, let me see here. Um, oh, let me go to collection statistics. This is all of them, repositories. I want to know about uh, the Museum of Southwestern Biology in Albuquerque. Um, we have, let's see, browse collections. Members. We were wanting, there we go. That's what I'm looking for. This is our collection at the Museum of Southwestern Biology. And again, this allows us to submit data to a common portal and uh, ultimately um, increase our discoverability of our, of our genomic resources. Okay, any other um, questions or comments? I'd be happy to start taking specific questions at this point. Um, I can go into more detail on anything that I've covered so far. Nothing so far, Marielle, but I was thinking maybe you could show the GenBank discovery tool. Since oh, yes. Thank you. It. Thank you. Yes. So I'm showing you the sort of more of the, a lot of the public features and access. As a collection manager, we have to obviously get these data into the record to make them available for discovery. So how do we know, how do we, if I have a, a GenBank um, linkage to my specimens, how do I know that a researcher has published? Do I go to GenBank and just sort of search randomly to hopefully find that they have cited my specimens correctly? So one of the things that Arctos does also is to provide reports and services and um, some data cleanup tools, some um, data services, but also um, find low quality data. So we have a GenBank discovery tool that is basically a, um, a SQL search that our programmer has set up to be able to mine GenBank for potential matches to records in our database. So I'm scrolling down all the different collections. I'm gonna go to MSB mammals, for example. And it says that there are potentially 481 MSB mammal records at GenBank as of July 16th, that might be linked to our specimens here at the Museum of Southwestern Biology. So if I go to that um, example, I can go to GenBank and there are the possible matches, which means I, I, and I can see immediately that these are indeed our samples. If I click on the first one, the specimen voucher field is here. So that's fantastic. Um, so they've added their record correctly. And so I can also download these. I can go to GenBank and let me back up here. I can download a file of, you know, a full GenBank records create a CSV file of all of these, and then I can make sure that we have the GenBank accessions added to our records. And that will also work for even ones where the um, voucher was not submitted correctly, so we can verify these. So let me talk, I guess uh, I'll also show you briefly some of the other tools that are available. So to enter data in Arctos, there's a variety of different tools. And this is important from the point of view of managing genomic collections because of the, the importance of managing parts. So I'm going to show you a data entry screen 
and where, where parts get added to a data entry record. This is one way you can have students enter data one at a time using this customizable form. We also have bulk load tools. So in this case, all of the yellow fields are required. Collector, some accession, um, a specimen name. And if I enter a scientific name, it must be checked by a code table. Okay, and if I enter an agent name, let's say, um, it will also be checked by a code table. So it must match entries so we can try to minimize misspellings. But the main important thing is after we get the locality, the date, etc., is down here at parts. So I could put in a um, liver tissue and these are my options for different types of liver tissue parts because sometimes we add different tissue types to the same container. So maybe there's kidney and liver in this container. It might be excellent. It's going to be in collection. The preservation may be, I don't know, EDTA. Uh, I could add a barcode here and remark. And I have the ability to add up to one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve parts for this specimen. What if I have more than that? We can also add more down here, add more parts using the add part tool at the bottom, which allows us, it was also very useful, say that the specimen was, was heart, kidney, liver, and it was also, it was both frozen and in alcohol, or maybe it was in 95% alcohol. I can add both of those attributes. Oops. I can also say at what date, perhaps this was one, two, two, one, a one, a one. And this one was 2021-07-01. So you can have track of a tri uh, history of the different preservation types or different attributes related. And who determined this? Perhaps it was Joseph A. Cook on when it was collected, but then it was me. Um, I didn't spell my name right. Search again. See, it doesn't like it if you misspell your name wrong. <laughs> If I just put Campbell, well, actually, let's put Marielle in there. There's not very many Marielles. When I search, it goes to the code table, and I have to pick the right one. So again, it helps minimize um, misspellings that impede discoverability later. So hey, Marielle, I, yes, really quick. There's a, there in the chat. We have. Can you talk a little bit about how you handle tissue parts that are not linked to a specimen voucher? Okay. So in this case, for example, that first example I showed you of Tanomis, um, this one, we, understand, we know that there is a voucher here at the American Museum, but we don't have it in our collection. Well, perhaps this was lost or never collected. We can still create this record with just the tissues, uh, you know, uh, with the information that we have and manage it. There is no requirement that there be a voucher. It's really the best practice if there is, but we can still manage just the tissues in exactly the way I've been describing uh, without having an actual voucher. As long, I mean, if, if we understand that it, there was, the, the tissues came from this individual, then we can enter the identification and the taxonomy. And we know where it came from, Oruro in Bolivia, and uh, we know when it came from, 1984, 4th of August. So we know that information that these tissues were collected then. We can still create the record and manage it without having a voucher. If we do have a voucher though, that voucher does not have to be in the same collection. In this case, it, um, the voucher is in a different institution. The specimen voucher for the mammal is in a totally different institution across the country that's not in our shared database. The parasite that's linked to this is in a totally different institution in a different state, but it is an Arctos. So I can directly go to that one and see the parasite related to it 
and it shows also the, the link back to the mammal. So collections within Arctos can easily create relationships. And in the, in the case of um, Kendall and I, we have, Kendall has mammals whose tissues are stored at the Museum of Southwestern Biology. So, and then for some we have tissues that have no vouchers. So what I'm trying to explain is that there, Arctos is very flexible. It allows you to manage all of these different scenarios. Ideally, uh, there should be some kind of a specimen voucher linked to the tissues, but it doesn't have to be in the same collection. It could be anywhere and we can link the data. And if there is no voucher, we can still put the data we have in and manage those specimens. All right, Marielle, one more. Can you talk about how you handle taxonomy changes? Cool, yeah. So here we are in uh, Tenomis opimus. Actually, let me go to the squirrel, because that was a good one. Let's see if I can get back to that record. Uh, maybe this one, yeah. Okay, so here's an example of a taxonomy change. So if I go here to this squirrel, um, actually this one doesn't even have um, the original name, which was Spermophilus undulatus. But let me go to, um, this record here shows that it was identified twice. Originally by Jonathan Dunham, uh, actually no, originally by the Mongolian expedition in 2015, the confidence was low. It was based on features, the morphological features, and it was a field identification. Then in 2021, it was re-ID'd with a high confidence, again, based on features. And um, if we go to this squirrel's name, and we go to our taxonomy page. This should, let's see if it shows it, give, there's a lot of information here. Let me scroll to the right thing. Has media, has maps of all the specimens identified as that taxon. It should also have a synonym with Spermophilus undulatus. And since it doesn't, I'm gonna create that right now. Um, so I'm going to edit this to show, where am I going? Oh, yes, here. Data in Arctos. Going to edit the classification. I'm going to, oops, edit the name and related data. And I'm going to say this is a synonym of, and let's see if this is even in there. The name has to exist first. if that exists. Yes. Cool. Use. I'm going to create that synonymy. And now if I go back to the taxon, hopefully it will show me somewhere in here. There's the map. There's all the media associated with it. Uh, here we go. So there's a synonym that I just created between those two names. So now if someone were to come in and search on Spermophilus undulatus, they would also um, get all the records that are named as Eurocetellus undulatus. So we can create relationships between taxon names that allow us to enhance the discoverability even if the name changes. And we can also, perhaps this was not a synonym, it was a misspelling. We can add that as well. But that allows us to create these linkages. And again, the idea is that we should be able to discover those taxa, regardless of what they're called currently or what they were called in the past. But we do have these names in code tables. So this is our taxon page. So if I search on Spermophilus, for example, the older name for some of these, um, I have to spell it correctly. I have, uh, it, ha it will search the existing code tables. And these are what is currently in Arctos for that genus. If someone were to try to enter a misspelling, they might not, might not find it, um, or they could enter it just through Spermophilus because we don't want to introduce new bad names. We want a controlled vocabulary because controlled vocabularies allow for discoverability. So everything gets checked against the code table before it goes in. Does that answer question? Any further questions on that? Yeah, and I'd like to open up the uh, questions for, you can type in the chat, you can go ahead and unmute yourself uh, if you have any questions for Marielle or Kindle. Uh, 
let me go while everybody's thinking. I'm going to search for um, something that has a whole genome. Is Carla here? Do you have your example, the whole genome example? Let me go see if I can find one. Oops. Oh, sorry. <laughs> can you hear me? Yeah. Um, yeah, if you search, um, oh, here I'll show you. Uh, actually, if you search MVZ and, and uh, other identifier type of biosample, I think it just comes up with the one mannequin. Okay, hang on a second. Um, oh, I'm logged in, so I don't have access. Let oh, me log uh, out. Okay. I'm log out. Hang on. Okay, so I'm going to go to search in. So search MVZ birds. And the M -M -M birds, there we go. Bird specimens and then um, other, ide any, uh, the identifier type, show more options. Put okay. in bio sample and I think that'll, NCBI bio sample right there. Yeah, I'll try that. Search. It should come up with one mannequin, I believe. Yeah. So if we look at this, there we go. So this is an example of a bird with an NCBI biosample. So um, again, we have the URL link out directly from the record to the isolate and the biomaterial and the different projects. Yeah, and, and we might want to point out that, you know, the nice thing about being in a shared database is, so for example, we just got a, a paper. Um, I just got informed about a paper that was published that used samples from MSB, UAM, and MVZ. Um, so we can link them all to the same project, same publication, and actually the same bio sample because they pooled the samples. Mm -hmm. And so they're not individually, um, you know, posted in GenBank, they're actually pooled. So the same uh, bio sample will go to multiple samples in different collections and we can track that through Arctos. Is that in this project? No, it's a different project. It's the one that, it's uh, about Junkos. It's a different project. I, I put it in our GitHub repository yesterday and tagged you guys. I don't know if you saw that. <laughs> I'm gonna go see if I can find it. So we also can search, in addition to searching on catalog records or taxonomy, Search, um, let's see, what was the name of the author? Um, if you go to publications um, or projects, either one, and search Junko, I think it's in the title. Yes, that's the one, Mike, thanks. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, it's the one about, um, yeah, Steger is the author. Um, Drivers of variation and junkle physiological flexibility. Yeah, that's it. And then um, this is the publication that just came out. Um, and so I added my specimens, and but you, um, but see, so you can see that it used MSB, and it also used UAM specimens as well, according to the paper. So yes. So this is, and it's um, using. And you're using uh, samples that were collected on four different projects, right? different field projects that contributed the, the tissues that were used for this. Yep. Which is very cool. And we can go from our project page. So if you go to the MV Zero bird catalog records there, um, actually I haven't entered the bio sample yet because I wanted to confirm with you guys <laughs> about this, but um, yeah, so they don't have the bio samples yet. Um, Interesting. So here I am just to quickly looking at the public view and you guys, when I showed you earlier what I saw when I wanted to get information out of Arctos, you, even with a public view, you can add or remove data fields. You might want to add, for example, um, all the different uh, other catalog numbers here. And you can add other things like island or group, or you could add phenotypic data. This is also really cool. You can get, um, you can have genetic data through the GenBank sequences, and you can also uh, link it to um, whether they have parasites or what is their gonad uh, condition, or are they in a reproduct are they in a state of molt, or you know you can um, 
add lots and lots of different phenotypic information. So let's just, um, I can save and refresh that and, and add that information, which then you can download. I would have to log in. Let me just log in real quick. You have to create a, some kind of public account to be able to uh, I'll go back here. We do have a couple more questions, Mariel, as we're okay. wrapping up here. Sure, sure. Um, so one person asks, are you typically the one to create a project when someone requests a loan? Yes, I create projects for every loan if it doesn't already exist. Usually I will, I will uh, in the project page, um, you can search on the, uh, the person you're sending the loan to and see if there is an existing project in their name if that appears to match. For example, if University of Alaska gets a, a, a request at the same time as MSB, they may create the project first. So I can just link to an existing project if it looks like it's related to theirs. Right, so that's in this case with the Junko project, it affects three institutions, but, um, and I think I created that project first. I'm not sure, but anyway, we can all link to the same project. Mm -hmm. It's really nice to be able to see all the different institutions that are linked to the same project and also publications. So we can see, you know, what was cited from three different institutions on a publication and also the projects. So every specimen record shows what project that's, that individual animal or, or sample has been used for, in addition to showing lo loans. And notice that I don't see, as, as a public user, I don't get to see all the details of the loan. That part is hidden and only available to the collection managers. I can only see it was on loan. But I can see information, public information, about the research that this specimen was used for and the publications it was that resulted. Great, and then we have another question. Is there a template where we can write the data and be able to upload the table to Arctos in one move? Um, yes, you can bulk load. And now let me log out real quick. Log back in under my, I have a, I have a couple different profiles. One is as a public user and one is as an operator. So we have bulk load tools and we can generate, um, a different um, bulk loader for different purposes. Uh, these are all of our fields that can be used for the bulk loader, which correspond to that um, that uh, data page. But you could, there's the template there with all of the the important columns, and you could populate this data field or database. Excuse me, spreadsheet and then um, upload it via bulk load tools. So I can um, bulk load catalog records. I can choose the file or I can also um, batch bulk load specific information to existing records. So I can bulk load agents or uh, parts or I can also um, use bulk loading tools for object tracking in object tracking, um, I can edit containers, I can add labels, I can create a barcode series, etc. So all of these tools exist for um, dealing with objects, including bulk code tools. Great. Well, it looks like we are um, just over time and we did have one more uh, observation that that record that you showed of Carla's did have a sound recording and uh, Arctos is capable of handling all sorts of media or as Kendall just pointed out um, that we can link out to other repositories like Morphosource or uh, Sketch, Sketchfab or where there might be 3D models. Um, but yeah, we are at time. So I wanted to just uh, take a moment to thank you very much, Marianne and Kim, Kendall, and to let you all know that we are recording this webinar. I know some people had some connectivity issues, so this will be posted on YouTube likely by tomorrow. Um, so please take a look and uh, maybe check back about that uh, previous webinar on tissue container and object tracking if you are interested in learning more. And I'm also happy, and Ken and I would also be happy to receive emails from anyone who has more specific questions as well. And you can uh, find us through the, uh, um, I guess, Arctos website. Thank you very much. Excellent, thank you.